Okay, thank you very much. So thank you all for listening, and I'm very glad to present you today my work. Uh, I do, like uh, yeah, like Jennifer said, on both uh, Rob Singer and Rob Coleman Lab. So I work on P53 transcription factor, and I try to understand how they regulate the burst frequency and uh, the chromatin uh, formation um, uh, of the PCT1 gene locus. So uh, the gene expression is a very complex process, which involves many different processes. So there is some uh, factor, transcription factor, which can bind on the promoter of different genes. And uh, there is also the chromatin remodeling, the nucleosome occupancy and positioning, and uh, the recruitment of the transcriptional machinery and transcriptional elongation. And interestingly, all of these different processes can be linked together. So for example, the transcription factor binding can induce uh, the chromatin remodeling uh, factor uh, recruitment and the, 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 the remodeling. They can move nucleosome occupancy. The transcription factor also can help to the recruitment of the transcriptional machinery and finally leading to the transcription elongation. So uh, to understand how these different process, we need to build some models. And one of the simplest and oldest models of gene expression is the random telegraphic model. So in this model, the transcription can be either off, where there is no mRNA which are produced, or on, where you have accumulation of multiple mRNA during the time. So if a cell needs to increase the amount of mRNA which is produced, the cells have multiple tools available. So one possibility is maybe to produce more burst of transcription. So this burst of transcription is when the gene expression is on. So it's possible to produce more over the same period of time. But it's also possible that one burst of transcription could be longer, which can lead to accumulation of more mRNA. And finally, during one burst of transcription, it's possible that the cells produce more mRNA. So for example, the RNA polymerase II can be recruited at a faster rate. So interestingly, all of these different processes can lead to the same increase in the amount of mRNA, but with very different molecular mechanisms behind them. So to study these mechanisms, I decided to work on P53. So P53 is a very interesting gene because it's a gene which are highly involved in cancer. Indeed, in more than 50% of the cancer, there is a mutation found on P53. So P53 can be activated by different ways, from DNA damage to heat shock and hypoxia, and it can lead to very different cell response, from cell cycle arrest, DNA repair, apoptosis, or senescence. So uh, to study how P53 interacts, we build some hypotheses. So uh, one of the first hypotheses is uh, we know that usually when the chromatin is off and there is no transcription of the genes, usually the, the histones are methylated, so specifically on the H3K9. So uh, if we assume that the histones are methylated on the H3K9 and the cells need to activate uh, P21, uh, we know that indeed P53 can bind to demethylase enzymes, so, such as PHF2. Uh, so maybe this P53 can help to the recruitment of the PHF2 enzyme on the P21 promoter and lead to the demethylation on the, uh, uh, of the nucleosome. So that could help to the transition between the off-state to the on-state, but there is still need for one of the steps. And we, may, uh, we know that P53 can also bind to acetylase enzymes, such as T60, so that could help to the recruitment of the TIP60 enzyme on the nucleosome and acetylation of the histone. So we know that when the histones are acetylated, the chromatin is usually more in an open state, which helps to the recruitment of uh, NAPOL2. So that could help also to the transition between the off state to the on state. And finally, we know that 53 can also bound to NAPOL2. So there is a structure, a structure uh, which shows that 53 bound tightly to NAPOL2. And we assume that this binding can help to the recruitment of the NAPOL2 on the activated promoter. So that could help to production of mRNA. So P53 could help to the recruitment of multiple NAPOL2, which uh, define a burst of transcription. And after a certain amount of time, uh, P53, which also bonds to histone deacetylase, such as HDAC1, could help to the recruitment of this um, uh, enzyme to the nucleosome and deacetylation of the histone, and also P53 finally bound also to EHMT1, which is a methylase enzyme, and can help the promoter to come back to the original state, which is the off state. So we saw that P53 can be involved in all the different states of activation and deactivation of the P21 promoter, 
So to study this effect, we need to find the tools to work at the single cell level. So uh, we need to be able to see P21 on a single cell level and on a single locus to avoid any averaging effect from different cells or different locus. So to do that, I, uh, uh, like I work in the Rob Singer lab, I uh, introduced 24 MS2 stem loops, so you can see here, at the end, uh, at the beginning of the three prime ETR of the P21 endogenous gene. So I enter them with using CRISPR-Cas9, and now I have a cell line where I have one allele, which is labeled with 24 MS2 repeat. So interestingly, with the MS2 repeat, uh, like you have, um, so indeed, uh, how does that work? So uh, you have a MS2 code protein, which can tightly bound to the MS2 stem loops, and by using 24 MS2 repeat, and the MS2 code protein is fused to GFP, you accumulate up to 48 GFP protein on each mRNA. And then it's become possible to detect the mRNA either on the cytoplasm or more interestingly, on the transcription site. So here on this movie, what you can see is some mutual cells which grow and uh, which have the MS2 integrated into the P21. And you can see one locus here, which is a P21 locus, which switch off and on over the time. So here you can see when the cell is transcribing P21 mRNA. So for example, on this movie, we have three cells. So you can see them here. So one cell in red, one cell in blue, and one cell in green. So you can see that sometimes you see the P21 mRNA, uh, and sometimes you don't see them. So if we follow each of these cells over the 15-hour movie, we can see the transcriptional activity. So for the blue cell, for example, we don't see any activity. So these cells don't transcribe P21 for the 15-hour movie. But the red and the green, they both transcribe at different time, which is a stochastic process. So you can see, for example, after 40 minutes, the red cell doesn't transcribe while the green cell is transcribing. So here we have a lot of cells. So I show you here an example of three cells, but indeed we did this experiment on 80s of cells or hundreds of cells. And we want to try to find a pattern between all of these cells to see how is P21 expressed on this cell population. So one way to do that is to try to think, okay, how much mRNA have been produced on each cell? So if we look for the blue cells, it's easy. The blue cells didn't produce any, any mRNA. So if we plot the cumulative trace, we have something which is very flat, close to zero. But if we look about the red and the green cells, these cells produced mRNA. So for example, if we look about the red cells, here you have a long period of time when you have no mRNA produced, which is here a flat time. And after you have a big burst of transcription with production of many mRNA. So if we average all of the cells we take, like 85 cells in this case, what we see is we have a flat line, which means for our population, the rate of production of P21 mRNA is stable over time. So, okay. But we can see other information. We can also check, okay, how, what is the probability that the transcription site is on or off? So as you can see here, we, we put in pink every time the transcription site is on, and we can see what is the probability. So for example, if you look for these three cells at 40 minutes, you have one cell every three, which are on, which is 33%. But here also the statistics have been made over the 85 cells. And what you can see is that's very flat. Indeed, you have 15% chance for a transcription site to be on, and it's very stable over time, which is normal because here we looked on uninduced cells. So uh, another way to look is to think, okay, if we take a window of time, for example, between four hours to six hours, what is the duration of the on and the off period? So if you look here, you have an on period, which is roughly 30 minutes, and sometimes you have a very short on period of one, two minutes. So in average, the on period is slightly more than five minutes. And the off period is almost 30 minutes. So to, to recapitulate here, what we see is indeed in our cells, we have a burst of five minutes in uh, every 30 minutes in average. So, uh, so that's interesting, but now we want to know what is the impact of P53. So here we saw that when we don't induce in any way in our cells, we have this flight cumulative transcription, so which is the rate of production of P21 mRNA. So now if we want to overexpress P53, so for example, in my cells, I induced, uh, I introduced a touch responsive element promoter with P53 uh, wild type. And when we overexpress P53, so you can see here on the Western blood that we accumulate a lot of P53 protein, 
what we see is uh, that P21 is expressed with a higher rate. So you can see here the slope is much higher when there is overexpression of P52. Interestingly, if we use a dominant negative mutant, such as the R270H uh, mutant, so uh, what we see is we completely inhibit the P21 expression, which is very flat, and that means that our cell doesn't produce any more P21 mRNA. So another way to overexpress P53 is to use a drug, which is a nuclein. So the nuclein is a drug which inhibits the degradation of PCT3. So that's lead to accumulation of P53 protein into the cell. And as you can see here, when we increase the P23, the P53 concentration with these drugs, we have a very similar effect than P53, an even stronger effect, with production of much more P21 mRNA than when we look with the mox so that means when we induced uh, P21, uh, when we induced, excuse me, P53 uh, concentration, we increase the production of P21 mRNA. But we can look more precisely. So indeed, if we look about the number of active transcription sites, we see that the cells transcribe more often, so the frequency increase when we look with the overexpression of P53 or nuclein induction in both cases. So interestingly, you can see here that when we use nuclein, the level is much more stable over time which is normal because indeed nuclein inhibits the degradation of 53 by uh, MDM2 and MDM2 in cells is under the control of 53. So that means when we overexpress 53, we finally, after a certain amount of time, overexpress MDM2, which will induce the degradation of 53. So it's why you can see an oscillation here when we overexpress the 53 protein and this oscillation is not present when we use a drug to inhibit the degradation. So if we look uh, in the same way about the on and the off duration, we see that the on duration increase with both uh, overexpression of 53, both with nuclein or doxycycline, from five to 10 or even 12 minutes, and the off duration decrease from almost 30 minutes to 15, uh, to 15 minutes. So that means that the increase in the 53 concentration enhances the burst duration and the frequency. So that's interesting because in my knowledge, it has never been shown that 53 exam transcription factor can regulate both of the frequency and the duration of the burst simultaneously. So uh, if we recapitulate, the P53 protein can regulate two of the processes, the burst frequency and the burst duration. So uh, if we go back to our hypothesis, we saw that uh, we assume that the deacetylation and the acetylation could be linked to the duration uh, of this burst so, for example, uh, if we use a drug such as UNC0642, which is a HDAC1, so a deacetylation inhibitor, we expect to have, uh, uh, excuse me, a methylation inhibitor. I don't know why I did this mistake, but uh, uh, we assume that the burst duration should be longer because if we inhibit the methylation, what we expect is to have uh, difficulties to go from the on transition to the off state. So we look on that. And uh, we look about the on duration, and as you see, it's as expected. The on duration increased from five minutes to eight minutes when we use these drugs. And very interestingly, the off duration doesn't move at all. So that means, as expected here, when we inhibit the methylation, we have like a longer time in the on duration, but no change in the off duration. So we assume that if we do the same, but using SAR, which is a deacetylation inhibitor, what we should see, it's a very similar effect with no change in the off duration, but a change in the on duration. So I did this experiment, and as you can see, we have a, a small but significant uh, difference, so that there is an increase in the on duration, as expected. But interestingly, there is also a decrease in the off duration. So that means uh, when the histone are hyperacetylated, because we inhibit the deacetylation, it's also easier to transition between the off state to the on state again. So that means that our hypothesis are not complete, and indeed it's a much complex uh, process. So um, now what I am doing right now is I use another drug, uh, new uh, 9056, which is uh, acetylation inhibitor. And what I expect to see is the opposite. So I expect to see a longer off duration, but no change in the on duration. So that's the next experiment I will do on this subject. So now I move to a very slight different topic. So indeed, what is interesting with this system is P21 is under the control of P53. And P53 is uh, both a very good stress marker. So we could use this to detect stress. 
but it's also an apoptosis marker, so it can be used to target the activity of cancer drugs. So uh, during the last years, I work with uh, the Ulrich Stader Labs, and we use the drugs LRN6924, which is an inhibitor of both MDM2 and MDF4. And interestingly, this drug is currently used in trial, uh, trial tests uh, to fight against leukemia. Uh, so uh, we use our systems, and it has been great because it gives us a very good tools to detect the activity of these drugs uh, on living cells. And we can, by this way, find like different concentration of drugs and see if there is synergic effect between different drugs. So as you can see here, when we treat with RN6924, we can see a strong increase in the P21 expression, uh, which means that we induce apoptosis by the P53 pathway. So to use these tools, I decided to try different drugs. So for example, here is a doxorubicin. So it's a drug which is used since a long time as a cancer treatment. And as you can see here, there is induction of the P21 mRNA. So we can see how long does these drugs take to activate the apoptosis pathway on living cells. So as you can see here, after 10 hours, indeed the level of expression decreases, but it's mainly due to apoptosis of the cells, which will arrive soon, where you can see that the cells start to detach uh, from, the, from the plate here. So, um, so that's great because we can use these tools to try to find synergical effects. So for example, here, I just pre-treat my cells for three hours with Nutlin. So Nutlin works very similarly to the LRN drugs and increase the concentration of PC3. So the idea is if we induce after with doxorubicin, what we expect is like we have more PC3 protein, we can induce more apoptosis. So unfortunately, I didn't have time to analyze this movie, but we can see just by picture that the level of P21 expression is very strong compared to what we had before. So that can give us a very good tool to try to see synergic, synergistic effect between different drugs, different drug concentration, different kinetics. And here we can use it to treat very fast uh, to see the difference it can induce on the P21 expression. So uh, to conclude, uh, so the last, the, 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 the two main steps I will do right now is try to continue on this uh, acetylation, deacetylation uh, experiment. So I want to try to target CYP60 with, uh, with the drugs to try to see if I can change the obturation uh, specifically. And I want to use also these tools as, uh, as the tools to detect synergistic tumor suppressor effect at very low drug level to maybe try to find a way to decrease uh, the toxicity of some drugs uh, but still keeping the same effect on inducing apoptosis on my cells. So uh, I want to thank uh, everyone from both my labs, the Rob Singer and the Rob Coleman labs, who helped me a lot on this project, uh, so I could never do it without the help of everyone. And I would be very happy to take all of your questions.